Thank you, Corbin. Let me encourage you to keep your Bibles open to that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5 are going to be our main text this morning. To those visiting with us, and we do have those visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Glad you came and worship and praise our great God with us this morning, and glad you're here for this time of studying the Word of God as well. I hope it will be a benefit to all of us, although I will say that predominantly we're going to be focusing on us at university and what this passage means for us. Now let me start with a question I want you to consider. If you were to invite someone this week, we're going to have worship next Sunday, we're going to have Bible study and say, you're going to invite someone to university this coming week. What would you say? Maybe you'd say, I think you'll really like the preaching. Stop laughing, Renee. <laughs> or you'll really like the Bible class that, that I'm a part of. Maybe it's someone who has kids and you can say, you know what? There's great classes for your kids and there's lots of kids in them. They'll, they'll have people their age. Or maybe it's someone that Maybe they're new in the community, and you know, you know what? There's other people in kind of your field, your stage in life. Why don't you come? There's some great people I'd like to introduce you to. Chances are, you've said something like that. And by the way, none of those things are necessarily wrong. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But they can be wrong. They can be wrong because what we're doing is we're appealing to people as consumers. Here's what you'll get from this. Here's why you will like this. Here's why you're going to enjoy coming to church with me. Are we going to go to anybody this week and say, I want you to come to church with me? Because we're going to be challenged to follow Jesus in a way we've never followed Him before. Or I want you to come to university because you know what? There's a lot of good things going on, but we need help. And you could be of great benefit to what we're doing. This morning we're looking at this idea again. What if an apostle wrote to us? What if an apostle wrote to the University Church of Christ in Tampa, Florida? Granted, that's not going to happen. So we're going to look at some things that the apostles did write. And try to make some application of, of what that means for us. So we've done one lesson already. We were in 1 Corinthians on that lesson as well, where we looked at the fact that we all, all of us together, are the body of Christ and the implications that that has. Today we're looking at chapter 2. And what Jesus would say to us is this, convert them not to you, not to the church, Convert people to Jesus. Convert them to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is going to be our text for that and for this reason. Rhetoric had a very large role in society in the first century. Someone's skill in speaking was of the utmost importance. A senator, if he was a good, uh, well, unlike me, knows how to use words, uh, if he was skilled at rhetoric, could very well sway the movement of the empire. Philosophers, if they were skilled in rhetoric, could convince people to buy in their philosophy and start entire movements. And by the time we get to the first century, rhetoric was not just something that politicians and scholars used. Rhetoric was something that was used for entertainment. Sophists would go around from town to town, 
And they would even have competitions about who was the best with rhetoric. And the audience would judge. And you would go from town to town and and you might have a following. By the way, this may very well be what's at the heart of what Paul had said back in chapter 1 when he says, and he's talking about division in the church in Corinth, and he says in verse 12, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And he goes on to talk about how Christ is not divided, how Paul had not been crucified for them. But that's the same kind of language that someone may use at that time of, oh, I like this speaker. I follow this speaker. I follow this speaker. And what Paul is saying is, is that's what you've done with the gospel. I came and presented the gospel to you. Apollos came and presented the same gospel to you, but you liked the way Apollos put it more, so you said, I am of Apollos. That's the background, the kind of community, the kind of situation that you're dealing with in 1 Corinthians And that's at the heart of what Paul says, beginning in chapter 2. And what Paul says is, here's what I came to do. I came to give you what you need, not what you want. Read again verses 1 and 2. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Pause there. Paul was not saying that he did not have any skills. Paul was not saying that he was boring and that nobody really wanted to listen to him. That's not what he's saying. You can't read the book of Acts and come away without understanding that Paul had a gift. He was able to speak and present the gospel to people. Time and again, you read of Paul when he's going out and he's preaching, and people want to hear more of him. They say, can you say this again the next Sabbath day when he's in the synagogue, when he's in Athens in Acts chapter 17, and even the philosophers of Athens say, let's listen to this guy and just see what he has to say. He could talk, he could speak, he could present the gospel. But what he's saying here is, I didn't come to give you an eloquent speech. I didn't come to give you lofty words of wisdom. And why is that? Well, go back to some things that he said earlier in chapter 1. Go back to verse 17. Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Paul says, I didn't come with lofty words of wisdom. Why? Because your faith isn't in how well I present the gospel. That's not where your faith's supposed to be. I did not want to empty the cross of its power because the cross is the only thing that has power. That's what I needed you to put your faith in. I needed you to believe in Jesus crucified for you. So I wasn't coming trying to impress you with my speaking ability. I came presenting the cross. I did not want to deny its power. And as you go further in the text, you can see exactly how that would happen if you were using eloquent words of wisdom. Because why is Paul going to say, what is the cross? To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. And so if Paul had only been trying to use flattery words of wisdom... What would he have likely done? He would have changed the message of the cross. He would have given it and tailored it in a way that they would find more acceptable, more palpable. And Paul says, that's not what the cross is. You need to hear about Jesus and the cross. And that's what I came and presented to you. Furthermore, he says later in chapter 1, in verse 28, And speaking of even how they themselves were not the wise, they themselves were, you know, what would be considered foolish in this age. And he says, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, 
who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's why Paul says, I did not rely on eloquent words of wisdom. Why? Because boasting is in God and God alone. It's not in the presentation of the speaker. And so Paul says, I presented to you what you needed. I decide to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, Paul had spent 18 months in Corinth. Do not take from this that the only thing Paul ever talked about were the basics of the gospel. He only talked about Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He just kind of repeated that same message over and over again. No, there's a lot in this. And in fact, you read the rest of the Corinthian correspondence, and it goes back to these points. I presented to you Christ crucified. Well, of course, why is it that Paul will later on chastise them for their immorality? Because they had once been in sin, and what had the crucifixion of Jesus done for them? He had washed them, he had sanctified them. I presented to you Christ crucified. Jesus, his death, is what washed you from your sins, it's what cleansed you from your sins. And furthermore, even the construct of the language here, he is saying, I present Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's a present tense. It's as if Jesus remains crucified. In other words, the effects of the crucifixion were not a one-time thing. You are still benefiting from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His blood continues to forgive you. His blood continues to sanctify you. And of course... He presents them Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Anointed One of God. Jesus the Christ who now reigns at the very right hand of God. That's who they needed to know about. They needed to know about this Jesus who is crucified for them, this Jesus whose crucifixion still benefits them, this Jesus who is the Christ reigning over all to whom our allegiance belongs. That's what he presented to them. That's what they needed to know. So let's go back to our original question. Why would you invite someone to university? All the things we talked about are good. Having good preaching and teaching, that's a good thing. Having a lot of kids, that's a great thing. Ha having broad demographics so that when people come in, there, there's people that are like them, that's a good thing. All those things are wonderful, especially when they're the result of disciples of Christ following their Lord. I don't apologize for any of those things. We should long for those things. We should strive for those things. But if we're not careful, then what we do is we're appealing to people as, again, consumers. You'll really like our preacher. Well, what if it was a clunker that day? Or most days? You know, what if they didn't like it? Your kids are going to love playing with our kids. Now, you know how kids are. Sometimes. Sometimes, I mean, they're just brats. Sorry, not, 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 not your kids. You're going you're gonna to love meeting these people. We have a lot of fun at our neighborhood devotional. I really hope you can come to that. And so what are we doing? We're saying, well, here's things you're going to like. You're really going to like this. And none of that addresses what they need. What they need to know about is Jesus, Him crucified, and Him reigning as the Christ. So how do we go about this? The aim is to give people what they need, not what they want. Well, here's what Paul says his method was. I demonstrated 
the Spirit and power. Notice what he says again in verse 3. He, he again goes back to his presentation. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Okay? So if, again, Paul had been in one of these competitions. Let's, let's line Paul up here and we'll put Apollos here. And we know Apollos from Acts chapter 18 was an eloquent man. Well, Paul would have lost. Paul said, I was with you in fear and in trembling. But here's what I had going for me. Verse 4, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. How was it that Paul's message was a demonstration of the Spirit and of power? Well, it's of the Spirit because it came from God. Go back up to chapter 1 and verse 23. When he said in verse 22, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but he says in verse 23, <coughs> excuse me, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. How is this a demonstration of of the Spirit, because it came from God. This message could only come from God. This message of God redeeming the world to Himself through the implement of the cross could only come from God. And it's of power. What power? The power to save. Chapter 1 and verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What does that mean for us here? Well, certainly that does have application to what we preach, what we teach. We need to proclaim what comes from God. It needs to be Spirit. It needs to be His message. And it needs to present to all of us, here is the power of God in this message. Here is how this message and following God according to this message changes us, transforms us, makes us into the people that He wants us to be. But that's not the only way in which we demonstrate spirit and power. Remember what the Lord commissioned His apostles to go and do. And of course, we know so many parts of this. We know the, the idea of you know, going out and baptizing the nations. We know about teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. But all that goes back to this one phrase. This is really the heart of the command. He says, make disciples. Make disciples. You make more people who are going to be like me. If you want to boil down what our work here as a university to a nutshell, is that. It is never about how many people can we have here, how many people can come on a Sunday. It's about how many can we help become disciples of the Lord. That is the work. And so, brethren, what that means for us is we have to demonstrate that that's our aim and our purpose too. Our lives need to demonstrate Spirit and power. So that means we don't need to be consumers either. And yet, how much of our discussions from Sunday are often about us being consumers? Now, I'll confess to this one right here. I'm bad on this one. Someone leads a new song, and it may be a great song, and I'll say to Nathan Shepard afterwards, is like, you know, that was a fine song, but it's not as good as O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I stand by that, by the way. But what am I saying? Well, that's, that song's fine. I, however, didn't like it that much. Or we may have a brother who prayed for a long time. And again, I'll confess, I'm, I'm sitting there going hey, I've got 30, 35 minutes to speak and that people are not going to want to listen to the end of this. But again, I'm thinking of this as a consumer. We've got places to go. I want to eat lunch. I'm hungry. You're hungry. And so that's what we're talking about on Sunday. How many lessons is Josh going to speak on in this series? Again, we are 
consumers. We talk as consumers. Here's what I like, here's what I don't like about our time together on Sunday. Well, brethren, being a member at university is not about being a consumer. It's not an invitation to be a critic. It's about being a disciple of Christ. And having opportunities to serve as a disciple of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This was our text on the first lesson that we dealt with on this, this topic. Where Paul deals with the body. And again, in a divided church where they were looking down on some abilities and some gifts, and he's trying to remind them, oh, no, no, every part of the body of Christ is important. You remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27? Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And everything else that he says in this chapter is really goes back to that. You are the body of Christ. And so whether you're a hand or an eye or those inward parts that are not seen, he says you are essential, you are valuable because all of you, all of you together are the body of Christ and you are all part of each other. That's what you are. That's what we are. We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So let me issue, issue some challenges. Now, what we do here together is important. Coming together, studying from the Word of God, worshiping our God, and by the way, when we come together, finding out ways which we can be disciples. How can we serve those around us? How can we serve those who are visiting with us? What opportunities are there? I will never say that what we're doing here is unimportant. It is absolutely essential. But we continue being disciples when we walk out the door. This church needs you. This body needs you. It needs whatever abilities and talents you have. Now, you may very well already know what those abilities and talents are. You may very well be exercising them, not only here when we're together, but also in your daily life. And you are a disciple of Christ. You are serving others. You're proclaiming the gospel. But maybe you don't know yet what those talents are. Maybe you're just looking for opportunities. Let me just ask you, let me beg you. Just ask. Just ask. Find someone who's been here for a few years and just ask. Say, I want to help. And let me tell you, there's plenty for you to do of being a disciple here at university. You want to help in evangelism and whatever level that is. We had a couple of college girls come up to me a couple of weeks ago and they just said, we want to help greet people. I was thrilled. Said, I'm not the guy to talk to that. Took him to Mike Benson. Said, Mike will get you started. Because they wanted to make sure when people come in, they knew where to go, what to do. They were welcome. That's a thing. That's a small thing, but it's an important thing. You want to talk about, okay, how can I help people to understand the gospel? How can I help set up a home study? Let me tell you, JP, absolutely talk to him. JP will get you started. Talk to Luke and Christina Hurd. Talk to them about the study they do in their house. Maybe you can do something similar. Maybe you can help them. Talk to the Hudsons. They can tell you everything you need to know about anybody who's coming and visiting with us. There are opportunities for you to serve. You want to help with the members here? Let me ask you today, go talk to Scotty Garth. You may know we have quite a few elderly members. They need help from time to time. They need help with rides. They need rides to appointments. Oftentimes we need help getting rides to church, sometimes with visitors to church. Scotty has a very small team right now who he's relying on to provide transportation for somebody. That's a small thing, but it's needed. Talk to an elder. Talk to a shepherd. Say, hey, I've got some time. Who could I help encourage? They will tell you who you could help. 
And let me tell you, while our aim is to help produce disciples, we are not perfect in that. We're not doing everything we can. And so let me ask you this. If you know of things we can do to help make disciples, please share that. If you know ways we can help the teenagers in their discipleship, I beg you, talk to the Wilkes, talk to the Schmitz. Say, hey, I'd like to, to help with this. If you know ways that your neighborhood devotional that you go to, that there's, a, there's an aspect of the community or aspect of the church that we could help, please share that. Have that discussion. What can we do? You know of things that the elders need to consider? Not as a gripe, not as a complaint, but hey, we can do this and we can help the kingdom. We can help people with disciples. I'm begging you, talk to a shepherd. We demonstrate the spirit and power of the gospel through our discipleship. And the aim is to bring more disciples. If we demonstrate the spirit and power, then others will want the spirit and power. But brethren, if we are just consumers, if we're just critics, if we're inviting people, hey, come to church, and then after church, <laughs> let's talk about all the things we didn't like. Then guess what? You just invited someone else to be a critic. What we're aiming to do, the result is convert to Jesus, not the church. Verse 5 of our text again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5. Paul, in talking about everything that his purpose, why he's not presented the gospel one way, but he's presented the gospel in spirit and in power. And he says in verse 5, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of God. I'm sorry, in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's his aim. Paul, in effect, is saying to them, I didn't want you to be a Christian because you like how I spoke. I wanted you to be a Christian because you saw the power of God in what I was saying. Your faith is in Him and not in me. Again, what's our aim? Our aim is to make disciples of Christ. Not to grow the numbers of university. Our aim is to make disciples of Christ. Fact is, none of us know what the future holds for this church or for any church. We pray, we work, we do what we can. But none of us know what the future holds. Reality is, quite a few of you will not be here in a few years. You'll have moved, you'll have left, you'll have gone other places. Now here's the effect of what I'm saying. If our aim as a church is let's have a large church, let's have a large number, then when people leave, that's sad. We miss them. And, and we do. But what if we think of it this way? What are we really after here at university? We want to make disciples. Then what happens when someone leaves us? That's just a disciple going someplace else. That's just a disciple carrying the kingdom with them wherever it is they're going. That's our aim. Our aim is to present Jesus for us to be disciples of Jesus, for help us to help others be disciples of Jesus. And the invitation we offer you to you that this morning is simply that. We would love and I mean love to talk to you about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We would love to explain to you more about what the cross of Christ means for us and what the cross of Christ should mean for you. The very Son of God gave His life for you. He gave His life for me. And that life that was given retains the power to wash us and to sanctify us. And the one who died on the cross now reigns. He is the one we are serving. And we'd love for you to be a servant of Him too. 
If you maybe already know the principles of what it means to become a follower of Christ, you have faith in Him, you know your life has not been what He has desired for you. It's not why God made you. You need to repent. And you need to be baptized. You need the blood of Christ to wash you and cleanse you of your sins and so that you can be part of His body. We would love to aid you in that this morning. If we can help you in some way, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?